sing all our praise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All our belongs to him. See, call the name, call the name. I hear your family, come on. Of Jesus. See, all our praise. All our praise. All our praise belongs to him. Father, we take delight in calling on your great name. Father, we take delight in you. Father, we thank you that as your sons and daughters, we have access to your great and wonderful name. And Father, we realize that only Jesus is the one who can meet every, every need that we are needy of. So Father, we lift your name.
Jesus King. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus will. Oh God, oh God. Only Jesus. 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 It's only Jesus. It's only Jesus. It's only Jesus. Oh, 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 it's only Jesus. Oh, 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 oh. It's only Jesus. Glory to you, God. Only you, Jesus. Only you, Jesus. Only you can, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless your name, O oh God. Galatians 3, 26 through 27 reads, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Family, let's put our hands together for Naya and Maverick as they prepare to go down in the waters of baptism. Hallelujah, they're getting ready to give us their testimonies. Okay, Naya what wanted me to read her testimony for her. And it reads, I was sad and mad. I was at home thinking about, I don't have my glasses, you all, thinking about my bad actions, and I know God isn't happy about that. So I told myself that I was going to change my actions. I know that God loves me even when I do bad things, but he loves me more when I do good things. I changed my bad ways to good ways, and it feels good. And I want to add that when we were, when we were in the back, she wanted to make sure that she belonged to the Lord. And she is sure now, aren't you? All right, praise God. Hi, I'm Mavic. I want to be baptized because I want to show people that I love Jesus to get my burdens off my chest. I want to thank Jesus for all he has done for us and thank God for everything he has done for me to keep me healthy. I know that Jesus will always love me and he is king. Amen. I know Jesus will always help me. How many of us know that? Jesus will always help us. Hallelujah. Let's stretch our hands out, family, and pray for them. Father God, we just thank you, God. We bless and honor you, Lord God, for Naya and Maverick, Lord God. Father, we pray that you will continue to grow them up in the knowledge of you, God, that you will continue to give them the boldness to stand and say that Jesus is Lord. Father, we love you, we honor you, and we bless you this day for these young people going into the waters of baptism. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, family. Let's continue in worship. Turn your attention to the screen.
God. Hey. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. My, help my help comes from Just look to the hills. Come on, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, look to the hills. Look to the hills, because your help is coming. Your help is coming. Your help is on the way. Your help is on the way. I know you've been praying. I know you've been fasting. I know you've been, been believing. But I came to tell you that your help is right here. Your help is not just on the way, but the help is right here. Your help is right here. Your help. y'all just encourage your neighbor and let your neighbor know say neighbor your help is here your help is here and we're gonna turn it in the hands of pastor and christian amen and as you greet your neighbor go ahead and take your seat take your seat take a load off your feet cool Good morning, good morning, Anthem Church. How y'all doing this fine, beautiful morning? I'm gonna talk to the very back because that's my rowdy crowd. Good morning, Anthem Church. 
Hey, hey, so good to see your smiling faces on this beautiful spring morning. For those who don't know me, my name is Christian. I have a pleasure of serving on your pastoral team here at Anthem Church. We would like to take this opportunity uh, to recognize a few people. Number one, can we give it up for the people that's online, that's viewing on the other side of the camera? We guys, thank you guys so much for tuning in whether you're catching the live or a restream. Uh, secondly, we would like to recognize our first time guests. So if you've been hanging out with us for the very first time, do me a favor and just pop your head up right there. And we just want to acknowledge you. Yo, can we give it up for our first time guests? That was I, I, if it was for me, but can we give it up for our first time guests? One more time. Yo, <laughs> cool. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. It is truly our honor and our pleasure to have you here today. We would love to connect with you. So do me a favor, it's a QR code that's right there in front of you. I'll take your phone out, go to the camera option, scan it in about 40-ish minutes uh, or 45-ish minutes because the, the man is on fire this morning. Pastor Sam, he's back in the building, y'all. Uh, uh, but in about 45-ish minutes, we would love to meet you right outside these doors. There's a neon sign that says, for new here, and we got a free gift for you just to say thank you for hanging out with us. Give it up for our first time guests. Cool. Hey, y'all feeling good this morning? Y'all all right? What about those baptisms though, y'all? Those kids, man. Hey, it is offering time in the building. Yep, I got about two or three people that's excited, but I'm going to talk to a couple of more people, and I know you're going to get excited as well. We truly get excited about partnering God in our finances. Um, it is our way to give towards mission. Our mission is so simple. It's to lead people to know Christ and... And make him known. There go my people to make him known. And for the first time guests, there's no pressure to you whatsoever. But this is for the members, frequent attenders, that we just believe in that mission and, and spreading the good news, the gospel of Jesus uh, towards the kingdom. Uh, so I, uh, as you guys get ready, uh, um, it's two ways that you can give. Number one, electronically, we are anthemchurch.com forward slash give. Or if you have a cash or check here in person, uh, go ahead and toss it into the envelope. And as you exit outside the doors, it's a container that says offering and you can deposit it there. Uh, as you guys get ready, I got one quick promotion for you. Somebody say one quick promotion. Uh, summertime is coming. It feels like it today. So all the parents out there, any parents, y'all ready to get ready? Y'all kids already, even though they, they ain't on break yet. Let's get ready because Anthem Kids presents Kids Camp coming June 9th through the 12th. Can I get a couple of parents that's excited? There we go. All right, got about 15 of them. All right, we're really, really excited because it's a ministry called Kids Turn. It's a high energy uh, a ministry that loves the Lord. And it's going to be June 9th through the 12th, starting at 6 o'clock. Uh, so all your kids, your nieces, your nephews, even look, look, JoJo and Jose down the street, let's send them on to Anthem Kids Camp. Uh, so it's $25, a very low cost. And we're excited because our kids are going to experience Jesus in a powerful way. Uh, 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 talking about God encounters and, and, and really uh, bringing them to the point to know more about Jesus. And I'm praying even more for uh, uh, salvation decisions. Can we pray for that for our kids? Yep. Can we pray that God just really shows up in a powerful way to capture their hearts? So be praying for that again, June 9th through the 12th. You can go to our website at weareanthemchurch.com, and you can see the link to sign up right there. A little later on, I'm going to show you a quick little glimpse of what's to come because it's really, really exciting. Let's go ahead and pray for our offering. Father, we thank you so much for this time to give. We thank you that you're going to take this a little bit and turn it into a lot, allowed to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Hey, do me a favor, because y'all seem a little quiet out there. Just turn to somebody and say, hey, how you doing? Turn to the other person and say, I didn't forget about you. You really ain't my second choice. You really was my first choice, but you look good this morning. Yup, yup. Hey, go ahead and turn your attention to the screen, and here's a glimpse of Kids Turn. And right after that, Pastor Sam is up on deck to kick us off in a new season of teaching. This is Kids Turn. Kids Turn. Kids Turn. Kids Turn. Kids Turn. Kids Turn. 
This is Kids Turn! Kids Turn! Kids Turn! How many of you guys want to go to kids camp after that? So, so good. It is good to see each and every one of you at Anthem Church. Welcome. If you're new here, my name is Sam. My wife, Taylor, and I have the wonderful honor and privilege of serving as your lead pastors here. And I haven't been here in a while because we welcome home our, our new baby boy, Jackson. So it's good to be back with you guys. And um, it, it's amazing to look out uh, today. Um, our, our word for the year last year was fruitful. How many of you guys know God's funny? Uh, cause we got babies coming out of the woodworks here at Anthem Church. And so it's just so great uh, to see that that's our growth plan. If you guys don't know more and more babies. So, um, it is good to be back with you. I've missed you. And uh, today, listen, you're, you're in for a treat. Today's a historic day here at Anthem Church. You might be wondering why. Well, actually at our 830 service, we actually had our biggest 830 gathering we've ever had already today. Um, and now we're at 1015, and if you guys could just wave at everybody around you because we're running out of seats, and it's great to have you here. Welcome on the other side of the camera. Then we have a noon service, and today for the first time ever, we're hosting our fourth Sunday gathering at 2.30 p.m., um, but it's going to be in Spanish. And so Iglesia Anthem is kicking off today which, uh, if you guys don't know, was birthed in prayer 15 months ago. So it's such an amazing thing that we're kicking this off today. Can you guys do me a favor and be praying for Iglesia Anthem? Our prayer is that we're going to reach people with Jesus Christ and the Spanish-speaking community in this area and make disciples. Amen? I haven't been here in a little while, but it sounds like you guys forgot how to preach back. Where's my help from? Okay, all right, you guys here today? And so that's reason number one. And number two, um, here, here's the second reason. Today's a historic day. We've, we've never done this before. Our church is a little over four years old. And um, what we're going to be doing over the next season, we usually te teach in a uh, series. What we're going we're gonna to call this a season, though. I'm going to walk through the book of Acts for the next three to four months. And we're going to be breaking this down in Act 1, pun intended, Act 2, Act 3, Act 4. You might be like, well, how long is this going to go? It's going to go until the Lord says, move on, Okay. And I'm excited for that. What we've been looking at in our Word for the Year Beyond, we looked at how God took a person, Abraham, beyond, and what that meant to us. Now we're going to look at how God takes a people beyond. And so we have a reading plan for you so you guys can get in the Word. We'll get that up. It already went out via email. If you didn't get that, go subscribe to our newsletter on our website. Otherwise, we'll get it up on our, our family uh, Facebook page as well. Well, I'm excited to dive in. Anybody excited for the Word today? Hey, can we just celebrate those? baptisms one more time. Wasn't that phenomenal to see um, our young people going down in the waters of baptism? Such an amazing, amazing thing. If you have a Bible, if you could turn with me this morning to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. If we're going to walk through the book of Acts, we're going to start in the beginning. Acts chapter 1. I want to look at verses 1 through 3 in your hearing today. Can you all stand to your feet in, the read in honor of the reading of God's Word if you're able? If you're new here, we, we stand in honor of the word because we believe that God's word is worth reverencing and honoring. Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. 
If you're taking notes, my title's a little long today, but it sounds a little bit more like a Netflix series, but I want to preach to you under the heading, the message that turned the world upside down. The message that turned the world upside down. Let me pray and we'll dive in. Lord, would you speak to us today? Lord, I ask you, would you ignite, Lord, every place in our hearts, Lord, that is lukewarm. Lord, we want to be on fire for you. Lord, would you ignite us today? Lord, we love you. And we lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We've got a special guest in the house, Pastor Eric Hampton. Happy you're here, brother. Thanks for being with us today. Typically, when you get to know someone for the first time, um, sooner or later when you're making small talk, um, what comes up is what do you do for a living? And God and I have had many conversations through the years. Is this one place in my life, Lord, where it's okay to lie? Where if somebody says, what do you do? Like, can I just say I'm a teacher, a life coach, whatever, an architect? I really just don't want to tell people I'm a pastor. Because when I tell people I'm a pastor, usually one of three things happen. Number one, I, I say, what do you do? And I'm a pastor. And then the person's like, well, I'm a believer too, brother. I follow the carpenter as well. Let's go break bread together. And it just gets super churchy real quick. You know, it's like, wow, you were just so normal until you found that out. Or number two, when, when you say, like, I'm a pastor, sometimes people are like, whoa, okay, leave me alone, right? And it gets really weird really quick, and they don't want to talk to you anymore. Sometimes when you say you're a pastor, what, what happens is, like, people like my neighbor, um, when I moved in, he's like, what do you do for a living? And I didn't want to tell him, so I was like, I work at Anthem. <laughs> and he's like, like, the insurance? I said, no, the church. And he's like, oh, what do you do there? I'm like, I'm the pastor there. And he goes, oh, beep, 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 just my luck. <laughs> that really happened. I, I live next to a pastor. Now every time I see him, like we're friends now, like, I'm like, hey, man, can you watch my house for a while? I'm going out of town for a little bit. And he's like, oh, must be nice making all that money being a pastor. <laughs> like, bro, we live in the same neighborhood. You know, like, <laughs> come on, man. You know what's up. <laughs> but how many of you know sometimes... Um, when it comes to like Christianity, when it comes to the church, there's just a lot of confusion on what Christianity is and what the church is supposed to do. You have your own experience too, don't you? When you've told somebody about Jesus, all of a sudden it goes to church, so I don't really like religion, so leave me alone. Am I the only one where all of a sudden it's like we're here, but all of a sudden people are backing off? Like, I don't know about this whole Christian thing. Why? Because there's a lot of confusion about what Christianity is in today's culture and what the church is supposed to do. And I'm not really um, surprised by that. Why is that? Why there's confusion around this in the world? Because there's confusion around it in the church. Am I talking to anybody today? I'm not surprised that there's confusion in the world about what Christianity is and what the church is supposed to do because there's confusion within the church even on what a Christian is and what the church is supposed to do. You guys know this. I can't not say this. If you drive to our church today, if you're watching on the other side of the camera, you might not know this, but there's actually 10 uh, churches on our street. You could go to all 10 and you'll get a different answer. Like we're, we're confused even on what a Christian is within our certain sects and within our certain denominations. There's many conflicting opinions about what Christianity is. And what sometimes we brush right past is that confusion is not from the Lord. For the Lord has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Confusion is a demonic thing, and the spirit of confusion, can we keep it real, is running rampant in our world today. So rather than just ignore it, I believe it's time to start dealing with it. I want to deal with the spirit of confusion today. So why is there so much confusion on what a Christian is and what a church is supposed to do? Well, sometimes it makes sense to go back to where we started so we can understand where we are now. I'm going to give us a quick church history lesson, okay? I'm going to cover... 2,000 years in about five minutes, okay? Where's all the note takers? I'm going to hit this quick, okay? It, how many of you know it's important to know where we come from? So, sometimes people are like, how, how old is Anthem? I'm like, well, technically we're four, but really technically we're like 2,000 years old. Come on, we're part of something bigger, something greater, the church of Jesus. And so quick church history lesson. In Matthew 16 and 18, I'll start here. Jesus says this, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, in the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word for church here is the Greek word ekklesia, which means assembly. Uh, back in the day when this was written, you could have an assembly of women. 
You could have an ecclesia, an assembly of men. Anytime people came together for a specific purpose, it was called an assembly, an ecclesia. Ecclesia is translated as an assembly of people called out around an idea. So, so at the ecclesia, the church can be defined as this, an assembly of the called out ones. Anybody grateful that you're part of the called out ones by the Lord? This was the original design for the church, an assembly of called out ones. And so what happens is Jesus dies, Good Friday. Jesus resurrects from the dead. How many of you know he's still alive even after Easter and you put your pastel colors away? And for 40 days, Jesus appears to people on the earth and he's talking to them and he's appearing to them. That's why we have so many eyewitnesses to his resurrection, which brings us to Acts chapter 1. And what had happened was Jesus, some of you know this, recruited these 12 guys and took these fishermen and tax collectors and outcasts and said, listen, I'm going to use you to be my witnesses and to take my message all over the earth. And this is crazy. This is mind-blowing. In a time and age where people wouldn't even leave their city or region, Jesus looks at them and says, I'm going to use you, yes, you, to take this message to the ends of the earth. Jesus comes in and says, you're going to be my witnesses. Never has there been a bigger assignment given to such an unqualified people. But that is exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2. Um, what happens next is 50 days after the resurrection. Somebody say 50. In the year 33 AD, Pentecost happens. The Spirit is poured out. Pentecost and the church is birthed. This Peter preaching under the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost sees 3,000 people get saved. How many of you know we need some good old-fashioned preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost still today? In the early church, the ecclesia in this moment was birth. The ecclesia is birthed in Acts chapter 2. It's birthed as a movement. The early believers, what you would see in the book of Acts, is they would gather in homes. They would gather in gardens. They would assemble simply around a mission and a message. What was the mission? What was the message? The message was that Jesus the Nazarene lived, died, rose, ascended into heaven, and by the way, he is coming back. And the mission was this. Now go and make him known to other people. Wouldn't that be a good mission for a church to know Christ and then go make him known? How many of you know our message is actually the mission? Yeah. Right? And here's what he says, now, now go do this. And from here, it's amazing when you follow the book of Acts, this ragtag group of men and women empowered by the Holy Spirit took this message of Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension and the word in Acts 17, 6, when they saw them walking on the streets, they looked at them and said, those are the ones who turn this world upside down. They took this message of Jesus all over the ends of the earth and turned the world upside down. And what had happened, uh, happens was, and you can document this, you know, we, we could all go to Google and look it up for yourself if you want. This explodes so much, this movement, the ecclesia, it's mind-blowing to think about something that started so small with Jesus and 12 men blows up on Pentecost in 33 AD. History tells us at the year 380 AD, three centuries later, Christianity, which faced major persecution in Rome, now was birthed as the official, uh, uh, official religion of Rome. A few centuries later, that's how much it grew. And when this happens, all the people who are hiding for fear of persecution could now come out. And they began to gather publicly, and they took over temples, and they would meet together, and it got big. And when it got big, they said, now we need to put some order in. And then the priests came in, and the hierarchy came in, and the staff came in. And people in this time stop referring to the church as the ecclesia, and they start referring to the church a different Greek word. You can, this is why you come to Anthem Church. You can leave here and impress your neighbor and say, I met and learned some Greek today, okay? They, they, the, the word that they used for the church was no longer ecclesia. They started using a different Greek word that was the word kyriakos, which translates not as an assembly of called out ones, but rather as the house of the Lord. Why is this a big deal? The definition of the church shifted away from God's original intent for the church. It went from an assembly to a place. 
It went from a movement to now sit and listen to someone. It went from slowly but surely what Jesus came to tear down was starting to be built back up, which oddly enough resembled the Old Testament where only one person, the high priest, could go into the presence of God and represent all the people to God. And here's what Jesus is coming in and saying, no, when I died and said, it is finished, I tore the veil from the top to the bottom, and the spirit that was only available for one is now available to all y'all, red, yellow, black, and white. You're all precious in my sight and now they're building up the very thing that God came to tear down and people start refer uh, referring to the church now as a place and slowly but surely something that started as something that was marked by a living breathing relationship with Jesus in the book of Acts is now moving to a lifeless dead religion the church had begun to lose its way and when the church loses its way the church loses its influence we are called to be the salt of the earth, and when we don't do and say and preach what we're supposed to do, say and preach, we are no longer salty to those around us. We're called to be in the world and not of it. And you see it all around us today. Could it be that, uh, I'm gonna say something a little strong, but I can't not say this, okay? Could it be today, that's why we can have 10 churches on one street but no impact in our city? Because a lot of churches have become museums and not movements. You see, when I go to a museum, I go to talk about dead things and look at old relics and look at old scrolls. But I wanted to remind you today, even though Easter Sunday's done, I want to say something that I said, because some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy. Why are you so excited? Why is everybody so happy around here? Because we don't serve a dead God. He got back up. So, so this is not a museum. We're, we're moving with him. That's it. Like, and, and over time, it goes from... Something that was supposed to be alive and powerful to now something that's managed. We, we go from a life-breathing organism to simply an organization. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say this? That is run by families. Church now becomes family business. There's churches that don't gather for Jesus. We gather to make money. Come on. We have special services, not for revival. People have special, I know it, but to, to take an offering because they're broke. And what was meant to be this, this move, this ecclesia, the, the movement is now changed into something else. And when you follow church history, the church continues to spread now into Europe where Germans pick up this word, Kyriakos, which is now the place of the Lord, and use this word and translate it in German to Kirka, which, yes, ich spreche ein paar Deutsch. I do. I speak a little bit of German. It's the word Kirka, the word for church, which is translated as a sacred place where you gather for religious purposes. Kirka is where we get the word, you can hear it, Kirk, Kirka, Kirk, where we get our English word church. And this progresses more and more to church being a place you attend and sit through rather than a movement you're part of. And so after some time, now we go from 33 AD, spirits poured out, Ecclesia to 380 AD, the Kyriakos, now the house of the Lord, and goes all the way now to 1517. Now we have an issue, but how many of you know God will never leave us empty-handed? Anytime God has a, a problem on the earth he wants to take care of, what does God do? God raises up a person. When God wants to deal with an issue, he raises up a people. He raises up a church. He raises up a people that are about the remnant, that are going to go back to the original design. I came to announce to you today, Anthem Church, we are a remnant people. We go back to what the word says, what Jesus preaches, and say it unapologetically. And so what happened was there was a need on the earth. So what does God do? He raises up a people called the Reformers, one of which goes by the name of Martin Luther, who said, you got this all wrong. We need to go back to what scripture says. It's not about one person hearing from God for me. I don't need to go to a priest to repent. I don't need to talk to the Virgin Mary. I don't worship all these saints. I'm here for the most high God because God tore the veil. We need to go back to the priesthood of all believers where it's not about one pastor on a stage that all y'all are ministers for the kingdom of God. And we all got one message and his name is Jesus. And when we take that message, we are to take it to the highways and the byways and every street corner. We're to call and go to crack houses and turn them into houses of glory. We're to take the broken places and give everyone Jesus. So he raises up a reformer that says we have to go back to what God said because church is not meant to be a place you sit. It's meant to be part of something you are you are the church and you are the church and we are the church and when we walk out of this place with one message one mission we too will turn this world upside down no eye has seen and no ear has heard what can happen when, when how many of you know where, where there's unity the holy spirit comes 
And now it's up to us in our generation, every generation, every generation of church has to make the decision, what is the church to us? Well, for me and our house, can I tell you, we're going back to the ecclesia. We are a gathered people, not the care. Yes, the house of the Lord is great, but we're called to assemble. We are a people. We are the people of God. And so that's what you see in Acts. I finally got to my text, and I just preached myself happy. I don't know about you, but... <laughs> A question that I ask all the time, I just want to make sure we're on track as a people with what we're supposed to be doing. You know, time and time again, if you follow church history, what starts off as pure becomes political. What starts off as pure, now we carry the wrong message and now it becomes a dead religion. As we've grown, I'm happy about it. We're standing room only today, maybe in three services and maybe four. But if we don't preach Jesus, we should shut this whole thing down. And so I go back to this all the time to say, hey, like, Lord, is this what you died for? Is this what you shed your blood, your precious blood to build? Is this what God had in mind when it comes to his bride, the church, the ecclesia? And so to answer that question, listen, I don't want to give an opinion. How many of you know we have enough of those? Right? We have enough opinions. Everybody has an opinion, right? To, to know what the church was meant to be, we have to let Scripture... Um, define what the church is supposed to be. And so I'm going to give a really foundational thought from Acts 1 because here's what I see is the message of the early movement. It was the message of the ecclesia that is still our message today. We see the message and mission they had as a people. And I want to pull out three quick things that we have to get right in order to understand this. Now, before I give these to you, how many of you know we're walking through the book of Acts for quite some time? Now, if we're going to do a study, I want anybody excited to dive a little deep? Um, I, I want to give us two characters because if we don't understand the context and author and who Acts is written to, um, we're, we're going to mismanage the message, okay? And so there's two characters I want to point your attention to as we dive into this text to make sure that we have the right message as a people, the message that will turn the world upside down just as we saw in Acts. Here's what I, the first person is Luke. Somebody say Luke. Luke is the author of the book of Acts, okay? Somebody say Luke one more time. Luke, the first character we want to point out is the author of Acts, Luke. Now Luke says this in Acts 1 and 1. He says, in my former book, Theophilus, I'm just going to pause there. He says, in my former book, now he's writing to someone named Theophilus, um, which, anybody shout out, what was Luke's former book? This is going to be mind-blowing. The book of Luke, right? That was deep. You guys, that, you were looking for, like, he wrote Genesis. No, he wrote the gospel of Luke, Okay. So Luke's former book that he starts off in my former book, speaking of the book of Luke, and he's addressing this to this, uh, someone named Theophilus. Now, it begs the question, just who is Theophilus? Who is he writing the book of Luke to and the Acts of the Apostles to? Well, we don't know exactly who Theophilus is, but we can deduct from history that he was a man in some prominent position who had heard about Christianity and was curious. And he knew Luke was not only a doctor, but he was an historian. Listen, Luke was a doctor and historian. And so he was curious about Christianity, so he hires a historian to go get information so he could write it. And what you need to know about Luke, Theophilus, Theophilus saying, I'm curious about Christianity. So uh, Luke comes in and says, here's what I'm going to give you. I'll give you the basics and what this is all about. And Luke is a very detailed writer. Luke writes in Greek, and his Greek is impeccable. His, his language is eloquent. He takes detailed records. Why? Because he's a historian. If you've ever wondered why do we have more information in Luke chapter 2 about Jesus' birth than the other Gospels, it's actually quite simple because it's actually thought that Luke interviewed Mary after she gave birth in Luke chapter 2. is actually Mary's account that Luke documented. Luke is so um, detailed in his writing. There's actually a story about a guy named William Mitchell Ramesay, a skeptic of Christianity who said, I don't believe in this, so I'm going to disprove the book of Acts. And so he's a skeptic, and he traced the missionary journeys of Paul's as recorded by Luke in Acts. He looked for evidence of what Luke was saying is actually true. And listen, he uncovered so much evidence in the towns and cities that Luke was describing without Google images, come on, right? No airplanes, like, the, well, here's what he said. What he said has to be true. It's so accurate. And he ended up turning his life over to Jesus Christ. He said there's so much evidence to Jesus and Christianity, and Luke documents it so well, I'm going to become a believer. And in Acts 1, Luke lays this out. 
And he says, here's what you gotta understand about the message of Christianity. And he writes to Theophilus and he says, here is what you need to know. And he starts off, and I wanna just give three things that we gotta get that Luke is saying to Theophilus to get our message right. I'm gonna hit these quick because this is just the opening message. I'm gonna try to get you to come back next week, okay? Here's what Luke said. If you wanna get Christianity right, the message right, if you wanna get church right, here, here's the message of the movement. The first part of the message, it's really simple. You gotta know what Jesus did. What, what Jesus did, Luke starts off with Theophilus and gets right to the point about the beginning of the message that the early church preached and, Mark, and, and turned the world upside down. He said this was their message. He said in my former book, Theophilus, what did he say? I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. In, in the summary, um, the summary of the book of Luke is simply that. It's all that Jesus began to do and teach. And can I remind us that this is what our message is about? You ready for it? Here's the reason we're here. Jesus. Like this, this is all about Jesus. Luke is saying, I'm writing to Theophilus, I'm gonna tell you even more about Jesus since this whole thing is about Jesus. Can, can I remind this church that Christianity at its core is not a set of rules. Christianity is not just some moral compass. Christianity at its core is the message of Jesus. And I gotta say something, you know, I, I've been home for a while, I've visited some churches. Um, one thing that seems to be missing that kind of surprised me a little bit from a lot of churches is Jesus. I'm gonna let that sink in. Like you preached really good and had a shout, but there was no mention of Jesus. Your music was good, but where is Jesus? Like a message that is missing in a lot of places is Jesus. People seem to be interested in teaching the application of a better life and how to get out of debt and how to have a better marriage rather than exalting Jesus. But I wanted to remind you, that's great, but man, can I get a witness? If I want a better marriage, I just gotta learn to Jesus better. If I wanna get out of debt, I need to learn Jesus better. Jesus is the answer to every problem that we have. Jesus himself now says, now that you got this message, here's what I want you to do. You need to know this message, all that I did, and here's what I'm gonna do next, Acts 1 and 8. I'm gonna use you to now go make me known. Jesus says this, this is the message, you know, all I did and all I said. And he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be, look at your neighbor, this is the only time I'll do it, say you, he's talking to you, he, you, you. you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. These men who turned the world upside down, Jesus said, here's the message, be a witness to what you've seen with me. Testify simply to what you've seen me do. Can, can I tell you in a court of law, a witness can only rightfully and legally testify to what they've seen. That's why this message, some of you like, skip me with this. When are you going to give me some application? Because you just don't have anything to witness to yet. But there's some of us here today that can witness to a whole lot of what Jesus, has, I've seen him do in my life. That I was broken and he healed me. I was lost and he found me. Can, can I get a witness? I could testify to that. Jesus says, I'm going to send you out to preach. And when you go... I want you to tell them about repentance and forgiveness of sin, how it's only possible through me. And tell all the people that no man cometh to the Father except through me. And tell all the people that I am the way, the truth, and the life. That I am the message. That the message is a person. And by the way, don't forget that this message is not only for one nationality. Don't forget that this is only for the Jews. I'm going to send you out of Jerusalem to the ends of the world. And so if they're white, preach Jesus. If they're black, preach Jesus. If they're Indian, preach Jesus. If they're Asian, preach Jesus. If they're Puerto Rican, preach Jesus. If they're Mexican, preach Jesus. If they're Venezuelan, preach Jesus. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus saying, if you preach me, I'll bring them to me. You need to lift me up. Preach Jesus. Preach Jesus. 
Anthem family, right now I commission you to leave this place in just a moment and preach Jesus until hell shakes. Preach Jesus until the gates of hell tremble. Preach Jesus until dead things come back to life. Preach Jesus. Come on, in the highways, in byways. Preach Jesus until limbs are restored. Preach Jesus until eyes are open. Preach Jesus until deaf ears pop open in here. Preach Jesus that he not only came, but he's still coming. Preach Jesus who loved the Lord world so much that he came for you what would it look come on that's our that's our message anybody grateful that's the message we we're called to preach Jesus could it be like when you look at churches that are empty what's wrong the church or Jesus when he says if you lift me up I'll draw all men could it be because the message of Jesus is no longer there we focus on lesser things things that we want to do I'm not saying like after school programs are bad, but we're a church. I preach Jesus. Come on, you know, like that's it. That's what we're called to do. And I'm telling you today, my Jesus has no favorites. Red, yellow, black, and white. How many of you know we're all precious in his sight? And people sometimes tend to get this confused. Well, how do you guys come together on a Sunday morning when you're from so many different places? Because here's the thing. We don't gather under a president's name. We don't gather like under politics. We don't gather under like our city's name. Here's the thing. The gospel is the great equalizer. So the moment you walked in the door, I don't care how much money you have and I don't care about your tribe or your background or how many degrees you have on the wall or don't have. The gospel makes us all equal in his sight. We are all dead to sin in desperate need of a savior. That is the gospel. Luke said this is what Christianity is. Did you notice that everywhere the early apostles went, everywhere they went, they preached Jesus? Yeah. Like, we're going to throw you in jail. They're like, cool, do you know about Jesus? <laughs> this guy's begging for money in Acts chapter 3, and we'll get to it in a minute. And they're like, you know, hey, you know, give me some money. And Peter and John look at him, gold and silver have I not, but one thing I have I give to you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And can we just keep it real? Sometimes we actually discount the power of Jesus and we look at somebody who needs money and we say, go to financial peace. And that's a good thing. But how many of you know, you could be debt free and still not know Jesus. I think let's get people to Jesus, right? And then see their lives restored. But everywhere they went, they, they preached Jesus. And here's what you got to see. Luke said, this is what Christianity is all about. He's saying in his book, you need to know what Jesus did. He said, Theophilus, I'm writing this to show you, this whole book, what Jesus did and what he taught. And you might be like today, well, tell me something new. Like, I already know all this. Do you? Here's my, here's my concern, church. There's a lot of people here, and I'm grateful. But I would, this makes me weep at night that one of you are going to get called home in the moment you meet our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's going to look at you and say, what did you do for me? And you're going to say, I prophesied in your name, and I preached in your name. And he's going to look at you and say, get away from me. I don't know who you are. And so do you really know Jesus? So let's just do a quick test to see. Like these are things we need to agree on that, that Luke says are, are, are basic fundamentals of our message. You ready? Luke documented the virgin birth. He's saying there's no Christianity without the virgin birth. That God's plan was to impregnate Mary through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he writes firsthand the story to Theophilus of how that happened. That God wrapped himself up in flesh, came to the earth. Can I tell you, if someone says they're a Christian but doesn't believe in the virgin birth, they're not a Christian. Like, it's essential. Come on, right? Because if he wasn't born of a virgin, then he didn't have power to save you with his blood. And he writes firsthand the story, right? And not only did Jesus come into the earth, but Jesus worked miracles. How many of you know a, a God who works miracles is an essential part of Christianity, that we serve a miracle-working God, that he can take your heart and redeem it? That not only Jesus was nailed to a cross, Anybody believe that he was nailed to a cross for the payment of your sin, for the remission of your sin? That, that's essential, that Jesus died for your sin, and no man can cometh to him except through Jesus, and you need to repent of that sin. Somebody say, hey, come on, repentance, right? And he's saying all these things, but not only that Jesus died, but that early Sunday morning, he got back up. How many of you know he's still risen after Easter? Come on, like, that's essential that he rose from the dead. We, we have to be in agreement. If you don't believe Jesus resurrected, that's not Christianity. And then he roamed the earth for 40 days. 
And then 50 days, he, after 40 days, he ascended into heaven. That's essential. Why? Because now he's seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. But he doesn't stop there. Acts chapter 2, he pours out the Spirit. How many of you know that's essential, that now we are empowered? We got some power through the work of the Spirit. And this is the message of the ecclesia. This is the message that turned the world upside down. And the first thing Luke told Theophilus, he wrote in the Gospel of Luke what Jesus did, but he doesn't stop there. And I got two minutes, so I'm going to hit this really quick. He writes the book of Acts, and he says, now let me lay this out, the second part. He said, this is all Jesus began to do. The next thing we got to understand to get this message right is what Jesus is still doing. How many of you know Jesus still saves? He still delivers. He still heals. What's he doing right now? He's seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty making intercession for you. He's bringing your name up to God. Like, that's a powerful thought. He's still moving on the earth today through the power of his spirit. And he's doing that right here, right now. And not only what Jesus did, not only what Jesus um, is doing, but let me close here. We also got to get this right, what Jesus will still do. How many of you know Jesus is still going to do some things? This is the fullness of the message that turned the world upside down, the message of our movement, the message that, that we need to get. What did Jesus do? What is Jesus doing? And one last thing, what Jesus will still do, Acts 1, 9, and 11 tells us plainly, after he said this, I'm going to use you and send you out all over. Jesus was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This man, same Jesus, who's been taken from you into heaven, will come back. I was, I was waiting. In the same way, let me try that again. I'm going to say will come back and then you get excited. The same Jesus, who's been taken from you into heaven, will come back. In the same way, there it is. You've seen him go into heaven. Jesus may have ascended into heaven, but the word tells us he's still coming back to get his bride. And he's going to continue to act until his enemies one day will be made his footstool. You know, this Monday, we talked about how today's a historical day at Anthem Church. Monday was a historical day for all of us is we had the, the solar eclipse, right? And my, my son... Um, was getting ready to go to school and they watched it at school and he had his little glasses and you guys know I'm a preacher so I'm going to use whatever I can to preach Jesus you know so we're going to school and he's getting ready and we start talking I said son you know some people I don't believe this but some are saying you know during the solar eclipse like the world's going to end so son here's what if you look up with your little glasses and you see a white horse coming from the clouds and he has eyes of fire in a crown of thorns and he's wearing a robe that says king of all kings and down his leg is a tattoo that says lord of all lords and he's wearing a sash that's dipped in blood and if you look up and it's not only him but all white horses behind him son you know what that means that jesus is coming back to get his kids <laughs> And he looked, and I said, I wonder if you know him today, son. Do you know Jesus? Because this is your chance. And he looks at me, and he said, I thought I did, but let me pray again right now. So I'm in the school drop-off line. I said, let's pray right now. Repeat this with me. I am a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. And I told him, you know, I don't think the world is coming back right now, but one day he is. But son, if you look up and see that white horse, you better start preaching Jesus to your classmates. Start preaching Jesus to your teachers, because this is the message message that turns the world upside down family wherever God takes us let this always be the message of our movement you know what movements have in common movements move God is going to move us through the spirit he's going to keep on doing things I pray that one day I'm going to stand in front of you because some of people are like four services what's the point of that until all have heard about Jesus we're going to keep on going this is the message and if you could stand to your feet I have two questions and an invitation today. Is there anybody here that would say today, I know Jesus. Anybody grateful you know Jesus? Everybody really grateful to be saved? Like, I know Jesus. I just want to make sure we're clear on our message. What is that message? 
that Jesus Christ came into this world wrapped in flesh, born of the Virgin Mary, went to the cross to pay for our sins. Why could he do that? Because he was born of a virgin and born of a human at the same time. And when he died for our sins, that blood washed away our sin, but he didn't stop there. He rose from the grave to defeat death so that we could spend eternity with him. That's why we can cry out and have hope today. Oh, death, oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Because Jesus has authority now, even over death, but he's not gone forever. He is coming back. That's our message, friends. That's the message that turns the world upside down. And today, I do want to commission you, if you could just lift your hands, if you're cool. I want to pray for Holy Ghost boldness to come over you in this hour. We didn't get in time, but um, presentation um, of what you say about Jesus matters too. I, I don't have time, but just don't go bashing people in the head with the Bible, telling them how bad they awful they are. But I want to pray for you, because you guys know this already. I'm praying for you on the other side of the camera. Lord, I pray. Lord, as we get ready to leave this place, Father, help us to be united, Lord, with the message of Jesus. Lord, I pray that this be a season. Let this be an hour. Let us be a church, Lord. Lord, we want to be the ecclesia. We want to be on mission, Lord, for what you would have for us. Lord, let this be an hour where we know you deeper and speak of you higher than ever before. Lord, right now as we look out, there's not even room for people to gather here. So, Lord, I pray that even right now, Lord, you would stir in the hearts for people to plant churches. Lord, you would open doors to buildings. Lord, that churches, I'm going to pray a dangerous prayer right now, but churches that have fallen away, either bring them back or shut them down so Jesus-centered churches can come into our city even right now. In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. Lord, I pray for open doors to witness, Lord, to who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. If you could, just put your hands down. I have one more thing today. If you could, just close your eyes. I'm going to be doing this all day. Many people responded already at the first service. But if you're here today, we have a room full of people that would testify is that following Jesus, Jesus the Nazarene, is the best thing we've ever done. And if you would say today, I want to live for Jesus, how do I do that? Can I tell you, the payment for your sin and his resurrection from the dead, it's a free gift, but something you need to accept for yourself. How do you do that? You declare with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord and raised from the dead. you got to say he raised from the dead and you shall be saved. And so if you're here today, I want to lead you in a simple prayer in just a moment. But one more time, we do have a room full of people that would testify following him is the best thing ever. And if you're here today... And say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm not going to embarrass you. We're just going to pray with you. And the Bible says when one person comes home, the angels in heaven celebrate. And we're going to celebrate. And then Pastor Christian's going to come up and give you your next step. So if you would say, today I want to surrender my life to Jesus. If you slip your hands in the air, one of somebody on our team is going to come, give you some information. We're going to lead you in a prayer. If that's you on the count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three. Anybody say, today's the day. Today's the day. Today's the day. Anybody say, today's the day. I see that hand right in the middle right there, young man. Today's the day. Hallelujah. Anybody else say, today's the day. If we could just pray this prayer together today. Can we say this loud and say it proud, Lord Jesus? Thank you for dying for me to wash away my sin. Lord, come into my heart right now. I repent of my past and I turn towards you. I want to live for you, Lord, and you alone. And today, Lord, I declare that even though you die, that you didn't stay dead that you are a living God, and I give you my life. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's children shout amen and amen. Family, can we welcome home this morning all the people that prayed that prayer? Come on and put your hands together, and let's celebrate this morning. Amen. Anybody ready to turn the world upside down? Yeah, baby. Hey, if that was you, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time or for um, the, the second or third time, we would love to connect with you and just tell you about your next steps. So we have a QR code that's popping up on the screen. Go ahead and scan it. Uh, or if you would like to talk to someone in person, we got a big sign in the back that said, I said yes to Jesus. And we'll love to tell you about those next steps as far as your relationship with Jesus Christ. Cool? All right, can we give it up for our first time guests one more time? Hey, hey, hey. Hola! We will love, love, love to connect with you right outside the doors. And we got something for you just to say thank you for hanging out with us right after service. We do have our prayer team. We'll be here at the foot of the stage. Somebody say next steps. Next steps. Just so you guys know, when we talk about next steps, we talk about no, grow, and make. Uh, and the part of the make component is serving. Somebody say serve. 
All right, we got many opportunities, a bunch of different serve teams. One in particular is for the 219. It's a lot of different things that's happening from prison ministry to street evangelism to foster care because orphans are close to God's heart and is close to our heart as well and the widows. And if you're interested in serving in that way for, for the 219 or any of the teams, go to weareanthemchurch.com forward slash serve and we'll get you connected. It's a place for everybody. And let's go ahead and pray. I'm going to send you guys out with the blessing. Father, we thank you so much for today. Thank you for reminding us of the message, Lord, that's turning, that turned our world upside down and that will turn others. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Now Anthem Church family, we send you out of this place to lead people to know Christ and make him known. In Jesus' name, Amen. You guys have a phenomenal day.